I have a lot of information to present to you in just an hour. And um, I'll just tell you in advance that a lot of this probably will not make sense to you until you actually have to do legislative history research. Um, it's, it's really, this presentation is intended to give you an overview of uh, the process and also um, where resources are located, what the resources are that are available. Um, you can certainly reach out to the State Law Library if you have to do this and you have questions. Um, there are several of us here that um, do legislative history research fairly often. Um, so please feel free to ask for help. Um, if questions come up during the presentation, I'll try to answer them. Um, if you would rather reach out to me after the fact, that's fine too. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with uh, just talking a little bit about why we do this type of research. And this is, um, this is a Minnesota statute, 64516. Um, if you haven't done legislative history research, these are, these are some of the things that we're looking for when we do that type of research. Um, or when the court is interested in it, when attorneys are interested in it, when parties are interested. Um, so I'll give you just a moment to take a look at the, the section in red. One of the things that I learned um, that was surprising to me when I first um, started doing Minnesota legislative history um, in more, de more in depth than what I had been doing before is um, I learned about these rules that the legislature has, both the House and the Senate, that indicate uh, that a lot of these things that we're gonna talk about today are not supposed to be admissible. Um, so I wanted to point that out, but then I also wanted to point out that um, the court has consistently recognized those rules and um, said, yes, we know that those rules are out there for the House and the Senate, um, giving us some direction on the admissibility. However, uh, there are times when we're still going to go ahead and take a look at um, the legislative history um, to help us understand what the legislature meant when um, laws were were drafted. Um, here are just a few more cases that are a little bit more recent, um, dealing with the current court, our, our current Supreme Court. Um, and this is something that you'll see if you follow the Supreme Court, um, and to a lesser extent, probably the Court of Appeals, you'll see that legislative history, legislative intent is um, discussed not infrequently in case law. So um, this is the basic process that we're going to talk about today. Um, the bill number is really the key that unlocks everything else. Um, but we start with the Minnesota statute. And um, from there, we walk it back to the session law. And the session law then will give us the bill number. From the bill number, we can get to the House and Senate journal, um, the House or Senate journal, the minutes, and um, any recordings, audio or video that may exist. And I'm going to walk through all of this. So don't be alarmed if you don't know what some of this stuff is. Um, so for the purposes of thinking about doing legislative history research, the primary sources, um, what we would consider primary sources for legislative history research are the minutes that come out of committees and also the audio and video recordings for um, House and Senate committees and also for floor sessions. There are a few other resources that we're gonna talk about. Um, floor logs, versions of bills. There are um, notebooks put together by the Legislative Reference Library for the legislative sessions. And then a variety of secondary sources that um, we'll, we'll talk about as well. Um, just a little bit about the committee minutes. Um, I think a lot of times people are surprised when they see the committee minutes, and I'll show you some examples of what they look like, um, that they don't have a ton of detail. Um, it's not like somebody is there, you know, transcribing everything that's happening and every word that is being said. Um, a lot of times, you know, you're not going to find the 
nuggets of legislative intent that you think you are looking for in the minutes. Um, the minutes will often be used to connect us to the recordings. Um, additionally, sometimes the attachments to the minutes are useful. Um, and I'll show you some examples of these, but you know, sometimes we'll have letter, letters from constituents, either for or against the legislation. Um, you know, there might be newspaper articles that um, have been attached to the minutes. Sometimes people will submit written testimony rather than um, testifying in person. And so those are some things that might be attached to the minutes that could be useful as well. Um, I'm not gonna read through all of these things. Um, the PowerPoint slides and a handout will be posted on our website um, after the presentation is over along with a recording of the presentation. So don't feel like you have to write all of this down because we'll give you the slides. Um, so the minutes live in various places depending on how old they are. Um, if you're lucky, they live online and they're easy to access. Um, if you're looking at legislation that's a little bit older, um, there might be some traveling involved, going to the Legislative Reference Library or to the Minnesota Historical Society Library. It just depends on the date um, of when your minutes were created. Um, audio and video um, of, as I said, of the committee sessions and the floor sessions, again, live in different places depending on the age of the, um, the bill that we're talking about. And so some things have just audio, some have video and audio. Um, it varies between the House and the Senate as far as what is available online. Um, and I want to just uh, make sure that everybody is clear that um, before 1991, there is nothing. Um, there's no audio or video before that date. That's just, that's just um, the way it is. And, and this is the reason that the legislature, the Legislative Reference Library and the Historical Society agreed um, that tapes, and we're not dealing with tapes anymore, but back in the day it was tapes, would be destroyed um, after 16 years. And so there's just a period of time, that 91 period, where before that th there are not um, audio and video um, recordings. Um, that that 16 year period has changed. Um, the Legislative Reference Library I mean, with the advent of technology, with changes in technology, um, things aren't necessarily being destroyed anymore, but that's the reason why things don't exist before 91. Um, I'm going to just briefly mention floor logs. Um, you know, one of the things when you are listening or watching uh, recordings and um, it may be an all day kind of a thing. Um, and you're not sure exactly when your bill is going to come, um, is going to be discussed. The floor logs can be useful if you're talking about a floor session, um, because as you can see an example from the Senate, um, it gives us the time of certain things that happened um, and lists the, the bill numbers. Uh, so that you have an idea if you're listening from, you know, one o'clock to 9.55, um, I mean, you wouldn't listen that long, but if, if that's what you were faced with, a recording that was that long, you could, um, you know, do some kind of um, moving forward to get to the point where you think your bill might have gotten um, discussed. And I'll just go back one page here um, just to show you that some of these live online. Again, it's a, depending on how old it is. And then some of them are just in print at the Legislative Reference Library. Um, another thing that I'll mention, but not spend a lot of time on, are bill versions. Um, sometimes it's useful when um, there aren't recordings or even if there are recordings, sometimes it's useful to see how the language has changed in the bill during its different um, versions to see how it's been amended. Um, again, you can see on here, some of these are available online and the older versions are available um, in different places depending on the age. But I wanted to show you an example of bill versions here. So this, is, um, this was some 
actual research that I did. I got these from um, Fiche from the Legislative Reference Library. Um, but this gives you an idea how the language can be tweaked to give you an idea of, um, potentially give you an idea of intent. And so we can see that when this bill was first introduced, the, the words and insurer were included. And then that was changed the first time it was amended to an insurance company or company providing reinsurance for the coverage. Um, so it was expanded. And then the word negligence was taken out and replaced by non-intentional acts. So if, um, you know, potentially you're doing research and you're looking at the, the non-intentional acts and you're wondering, oh, I wonder if that means negligence. Um, it might be useful to see that the word negligence was originally there and then was taken out. So that's how bill versioning can potentially be useful um, in determining a tent, if, it, particularly if you just don't have a lot, a lot of other things to look at. So I'm going to walk you through two examples during this um, CLE, one where um, everything is online and one where almost nothing is online, uh, just to give you an idea of kind of uh, the difference in the amount of work and um, what's available. So this is a statute um, that we're going to take a look at, and we're particularly interested in the 2019 amendments. So this is the statute um, dealing with this reestablishment of parent and child relationship. And if you scroll down on the reviser of statutes page, at the very bottom, you'll see this history section. Um, and, and I'm just gonna tell you that I have access to Lexis and Westlaw on my desktop, um, but when I'm doing, when I'm working with statutes and session laws, um, I prefer to use the Reviser of Statutes page. It's, they've done a really nice job. Um, things are hooked up in a really helpful way. Um, so just a plug for the Reviser's office, they, they do a, a really nice job with um, putting our laws online. Um, so what we've got at the bottom of this page is typically the first link in the history section is gonna be the first version of the bill, the original version of the bill. And then um, you'll have links that to all of the different amendments, the session laws that amended the original bill. Um, so just a, kind of a reminder, if, if this has been a long time or if you've never thought about it, the difference between statutes and session laws. Um, the statutes are um, kind of the, the current snapshot of all of the laws that are enforced and they're grouped together by topic. The session laws are just a compilation of all of the laws that were passed during a particular legislative session, and they're just published in order uh, of passage. So they're not grouped together by any other um, method other than just um, the order in which they were passed. Um, one of the things I'll mention is that we're lucky here with this particular example because there's just been one amendment. But sometimes you'll look at this history section and you'll have, you know, it'll be this big. It'll be, you know, there might be 20 session laws listed there. And to go through every single session law to try to find the language that you're interested in to figure out, you know, where to even start your legislative history research is very daunting. And so, um, what you can do instead, and what I do if I'm ever faced with that situation, is I hop on Westlaw um, because the editors at West provide a nice little summary, and I'll show you an example of um, the different session laws, what they did. So this is the same statute on Westlaw. If you scroll down to the bottom, they have a similar kind of box called credits. And I'll tell you that. Um, Sometimes you'll find a statute, particularly an older statute, where the credits box on Westlaw is looks different from the history box on the reviser of statutes. I'm not positive, but I think it's just based on some older materials not being on Westlaw, and so they're not in that credits box. I, I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that, or if there's anybody on um, the presentation from West who wants to correct me, um, please do. So the next screen is, um, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. Um, on the top of the Westlaw page, there's a tab called history. So we're gonna click on the history tab. 
And we're going to go to this page that has a box called editors and revisers notes. So this is still, we're still within the statute. And the, um, on this page, we have something called historical and statutory notes. This is where the editors at West have provided us um, summaries of what the session laws have done. And so um, here they're telling us that the 2019 legislation rewrote subdivision um, three, it added subdivision three A and four, um, it rewrote subdivision seven and eight. And so it gives us a nice little summary. Um, so in particular, if we're interested only in the, the this part of the statute that's contained in subdivision three A, we know um, this is what we, you know, we want to take a look at this. Um, let me show you yeah, here's another example. This is a totally different statute, but this is just an example that has some additional history to it. The one we were looking at only had the 2019 legislation, but this is a, a different statute that's been amended more times. And so if you look towards the bottom of your screen, um, it tells us what the laws of 20, 2005 did. Um, it um, made an amendment. And then in, 20, in 2008, um, there was a small change. And then in 2010, sub, subdivision four was added. So when I was doing this research, I was particularly interested in subdivision four. So I knew that I didn't have to look at all of the other session laws that were linked at the bottom of the statute. I could jump right to the, 29, right to the 2010 legislation um, and start my research there. Um, so if you're looking at the Reviser of Statutes page and you, you click on Statutes, which is that first link in the red bar, um, this is one of the options that you have, um, which I point out, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it can be kind of helpful. Um, the link over on the right-hand side to Statutes New, Amended, or Repealed, um, if you click on that, you come to this page. Um, this isn't super helpful because this is giving us all legislation for all sessions. Um, but we, what you can do is um, you can enter your statute section in the box there and you can choose all legislative sessions. Now notice that this only goes back to 1994. So if your um, if you're statute that you're researching was created before 94, this is not going to give you everything. But if you have some kind of newer legislation, as this legislation is that we were researching, um, the 94 to present is, um, is great. And you can also pick a particular legislative session if you only want to look at a particular year. But what this does is it gives us a little um, listing of everything that's happened to the statute. So we can see it was created in 2013. Um, and then some different things happened to it. Um, in 2019. So I wanted just to um, decipher what this language is in the history section in case some of this is um, new to you. So we take a look at this 2019 C14 S1 through 5. And what that's referring to is um, the session law chapter. And here again is the down here is the site that we were looking at. So it's the 2019 session laws. The C14 stands for chapter 14. The S1 through 5 means sections within the chapter, sections 1 through 5. And the session law is where we find the bill number. So we look at this. It's always going to be at the top here. Um, this was House File 5554. So that's an important thing to write down because we're going to need that for everything else that we're looking at. Now, over here on the right hand side under resources, there's this very important link to history and authors. That's what you're going to click on to start your research. So if we click on that, we come to this page and I'm just going to walk you through. There's a ton of stuff on this page and I'm just going to walk you through um, all the different content that we have on here and what you might use it for. Um, so for newer legislation, we're really lucky because the House Journal and the Senate Journal pages are actually linked up to the, to the bill. The older um, legislation 
which I'll show you in a little bit, um, you have to actually go to books and, and you have to go to the actual journal books and look them up. But here it's all nicely um, listed on the page, linked on the page. If we scroll down, we'll see the um, Senate journal pages. So we've got House and Senate both listed. Up at the top in the middle, we have a link to the companion bill. Um, when you're doing legislative history research, you're going to want to take a look at the companion bill to see if there was anything useful that happened um, when it was in the other chamber. We also have links to the different versions of the bill for newer legislation, which is very helpful. Yeah, here, this gives you an an idea of what we're talking about. So the bill as it was first introduced um, and then it was amended a couple of times or it had different language added a couple of times and we have links to, the, to it right here on the page. Um, then we have a couple of things over on the right, at the top right, the house research summary um, and then fiscal notes, which I'm not gonna really go over, but the House Research Summary, that looks like it's going to be something really juicy and it's going to be great. And you go to it and it's really not that helpful typically. Um, really what it is, is a, a, a document that's put together for legislators to um, have a summary of, of the legislation and um, what it's intending to do, but doesn't tend to really get into legislative history. So if we go back to this page, um, just wanted to make it, give you some information about the journals. Um, I mentioned that sometimes you have to look in the books and sometimes they're online. So this is, gives you an information about um, when they started to be put online. Um, the print journals we have at the State Law Library. Um, they're also available at the Legislative Reference Library. Um, but if you happen to need some journal pages, we and they're not online, we have them here. Um, okay, so let's take a look at what happened to this bill. Um, this is this is something really important that you want to look for. Um, well, a couple things th that you want to look for when you're doing legislative history research is you need to know um, when it went to committee and what committee it went to and how long it was there. Um, that's all important information to know. Um, it's not as important when everything's kind of linked up for you, but when everything isn't linked up for you, it becomes uh, much more important. Um, but so we can see that on January 31st, it was um, referred to the Health and Human Services Policy. Some authors were added. Then there was a committee report um, issued by the Health and Human Services Policy Committee um, that had some amendments that was made to it, and then it was referred to a different committee. So I just want to show you what this committee report looks like. Um, again, it's not, you know, for those of you that maybe have done a federal legislative history research, it's not, you're not going to get the same kind of juicy, helpful information that you might get from a committee report when you're doing federal um, legislative history research. But this is what the, re the committee report looks like. Basically, it's just telling you what the committee is um, saying should be changed, what language should be changed. Um, and then it was referred on to the other committee. So the uh, one of the other links we have here, and this is a very important link, is this further committee actions um, in this top middle here. And when we click on this, this is where we get to those things that we talked about earlier as being the primary um, sources. We get links to the minutes and um, on the minutes, I'll show you, you'll have a link to the audio. Now this is wonderful if you're doing research that is um, you know, newer, newer legislation. Um, it's wonderful how everything is hooked up. You're lucky if you have that assignment to do or if that's your, your assignment that you give yourself, you just go yay when you when it's legislation that's new, because um, this is all very helpfully hooked up together. So let's just take a look at the minutes. Um, I talked to you before about how they're not super detailed. Um, and so I'm just going to scroll down the page a little bit. 
so you can see what we're talking about. So these are the minutes for our house bill that we're researching. Um, there's not a whole lot here, um, but what's important is for us to know who testified. Um, we see who testified in favor, we can see who testified in opposition, um, and we can see kind of when all this happened. And so this is what you get from the minutes typically is just this type of information. Um, but again, with this new legislation, we get all of these attachments that I referred to earlier um, listed here as hearing documents. So these are um, some other things that are related to the legislation that were provided to the legislators. And um, it's all very helpfully linked up here right on the minutes. So that's very useful. And then going down the page a little bit, um, we have a link to the audio um, and also the video. So this is great to have, um, very easy to access. Um, I'm just going to show you kind of the reality and maybe some of you have done this research in the past. Um, this is what you used to have to do. Um, I took this picture when I was doing research over at the Historical Society. You, you got your cassette tapes, you put them in the cassette tape player, you put your headphones on and you sat there and you, you, know, you took notes. Um, that's one thing that to mention is that that's the reality too, that is still the reality that um, these, these um, hearings are not transcribed. And so, you're still gonna have to listen and you know, kind of take notes as you go along. Um, but it's a lot, certainly a lot easier with the um, recordings being online. So you know, what you're looking for when you're doing this research is, is a statement at the beginning from the sponsor as to why, they're, um, why they created the bill, why they're putting it forth. Um, and then testimony talking about um, who might be in opposition, why they're in opposition, or why somebody might support it. Um, this particular day that I was over at the Historical Society, I remember um, I was listening to the cassette tapes and I'm, you know, fast forwarding, trying to get to the spot on the tape where my legislation showed up. And, um, and I happened to, to stop on this um, discussion that was happening about uh, a bill that was going to amend the um, privacy statute to allow recordings in hospital rooms. And the bill sponsor was talking about the fact that um, this was needed in situations where there's a, where's a suspicion that the parent was potentially um, making the child sick. And so that, so they talked about why, why they, it was important to have this um, change in the law. And then somebody who sounded uh, to be kind of an older gentleman um, piped up and talked about how he remembered when the, and we're talking about like the, the peeping time, Tom statute, you know, um, surreptitiously viewing somebody without their knowledge um, in a private setting. And he piped up and said, well, I remember when, you know, we first created the statute and it was because of that landlord in Duluth that had the peepholes in the closets. Um, and so, I mean, you really do hear <laughs> why legislation was created um, by listening to the testimony. Now, granted, you know, this was back in the day when maybe they were a little bit more um, kind of free with their words when everything wasn't on the internet, but it was it was an interesting thing to listen to, even though I was it wasn't part of my research. Um, okay, so let's go back to our legislation we were researching. So we were researching House File 5554. Um, and then we've got information about the companion bill in the top um, in the top center. So again, it's um, when you walk through um, you know, looking at the minutes and taking a look at the audio or video, um, you often will need to do that twice. Um, also for the companion bill, if there were things of consequence that happened in the other chamber. So if you click on that, um, 
Senate file 342, you come to the Senate page, which is very similar, um, very similar look. And again, um, I'm not going to walk through all of this for you again, but this this link in the top middle that says committee hearings and actions, that's um, that's the link that gets you to the um, the good stuff. And I'll just make a statement here, and I hope there isn't anybody from the Senate on um, that I would be offending. But what we have what we have noticed in our research, um, doing research over the years, is that a lot of the Senate links are broken. Um, the House links tend to be better, um, and I'm not sure what the reasoning is, but if you ever come across that where you um, have a broken link, you're, you know, you're on the page and you're like, oh, awesome, my thing that I need is here, and you click on the link and it, you know, it doesn't go anywhere, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out to us because there are ways to to get to these things through the back door. And if we, if it truly is just the content is broken on the page, um, also the legislative reference library has told us that they can often um, through their magical ways, get to the original um, materials that, um, that are hidden behind a broken link. So don't, don't give up all hope if you have a broken link because sometimes that does happen. Okay, I'm going to um, jump to our second example where not everything is online and almost nothing is online. And so it's a similar process that, you know, we start with the statutes, um, we look up the session law to get the bill number, then we go to the journals in paper to find out what happened to the bill. And so I'll kind of walk through that here. So this is a um, an old statute that I was doing some research on. And um, just an example here of, um, we've got some links here. The original legislation was created in 1990. It was amended in 92 and then again in 97. Um, I had somebody that was interested in that subdivision four of this legislation dealing with judicial review. And so that was the research that I was doing. Um, and I actually, this is a little bit of a, a, a kind of a, um, not a great example because we're talking about 1990 date. Um, but let me just show you what I found here. And it, remember 1990 that there's no audio and video. But let's go to the session law, take a look. So this is what the session law looked like. Um, and here this gives us the uh, um, the bill number. So this was a Senate bill, SF number 2383. So this was Senate file 2383, um, chapter 386, section one. So there is our session law. Now we can see this was the original legislation. Everything underlined is new. So this is where I found out, oh, that subdivision four was actually part of the original legislation. Um, so that, that gives you an idea of, um, you know, how these things look and how they operate if you haven't done this before. Um, so just a word about the House and Senate journals in paper when they're not hooked up. Um, and I'll walk you through how this works. Um, but basically you start in the index and you look up your bill that way and um, you write down relevant dates and I'll, I'll walk through all of this. Um, again, we have them in paper at the State Law Library and over at the Legislative Reference Library. This is what they look like. The um, House journals are black, the Senate journals are green. And so you'd be looking for the index volume. <clears throat> we had a Senate bill, so I'm looking at the index for the Senate for the year of the bill that we're talking about or the, the legislative session. So you open it up in the index to your bill number and um, hopefully you can see this okay. But what this is giving us is all of the page numbers in the, the volumes of the journal where your bill is mentioned. And so some of these things are just not really that important to look up. 
Um, the first reading and reference, you definitely want to look that up because that's going to tell you when it went to committee and what committee it went to. Um, second reading, typically, it's that's all it is. It's just it was read again. Excuse me for one. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, other proceedings, I depending on the bill, I might look these up. Um, the one that you want to look up is anything any of them that has an A after it, like we can see the 6778A, that means that it was amended. Um, so it's helpful to look that up. Um, the third reading isn't super useful. It was read again. Typically that's where you're gonna have a, a vote. So if you're interested in how the vote came out, um, that would might be useful. Um, return from the House, That's this was a Senate bill. So that tells us when it came back from the House. Um, the approved, when it was approved by the governor, sometimes you really are gonna wanna know that if you're interested in um, the effective date. Um, so let's just take a look here at some of these pages so you can see what they are. Uh, so this was the first reading and referral. This is that page um, that was listed first. And so this tells us that Senate file 2383, um, bill relating to the city of Uppsala, permitting the establishment of a boundary commission. And it was referred to the Committee on Local and Urban Government. So next I wanna show you the page that had that A next to it. And this was a pretty, pretty big amendment. Um, it was changed from city of Uppsala was changed to a statutory or home rule charter city. Um, and Morrison was deleted for county um, and it was changed to counties in which the city is located. So this, be, this started out as a very specific piece of legislation um, about j this, just this one city. And it was made a much broader piece of legislation by this one amendment. And then we note the date here. This was March 19th, 1990. So again, sorry, this was March 6th, 1990. It went into committee. We had this amendment. Um, here was the third reading. Um, again, you can see there's, there's not a whole lot there other than you can see the vote. Um, and then we have the date. And so this gives us an idea of um, when it was sitting in committee. And that's important for us when we're doing this kind of paper research to know how long it was in committee. So these are the dates that were really were kind of um, important to note um, when it went to committee and which committee, and then when it was approved. So we kind of have an idea of when there might have been testimony happening um, between March 6th and March 20th is when there might have been um, committee action going on. So the next thing we need to do in paper is we need to find the companion bill, um, which is a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with paper. Um, there's actually a table of companion numbers. And I will be honest that I, um, I feel like I never explain this very well when I do this training, um, but this is what it looks like. So we've got the bill number up at the top in the first column. Um, House Companion and Senate Companion. So our bill number was 2383, and it was a Senate bill. So to find the House Companion, we go to the second column. So we know that the Senate, or I'm sorry, the House Companion bill was 2683. Now, if we had been starting with a House bill, House Bill 2383, then we would want to go to the third column and find our Senate companion number, which would be 2160. So because, you know, there is going to be a House File 1 and a Senate File 1, a House File 2, a Senate File 2. So you'll have bill numbers that are the same, one for the House, one for the Senate. So which companion column you go to depends on what you're starting with, which, which um, House or Senate that you're starting with. So we have our dates that we're interested in. And the next step is to look for minutes. And um, the minutes are not going to be online for older things. And so they're going to live in various places, um, depending again on the date. And also with the, um, the audio. So 
you know, this is the reality of COVID time is that the legislative reference library is still closed to the public right now. And so you can't go there, um, but you can, you can put in requests to the librarians remotely um, to see if they could, you know, if you have sufficient amount of information, if they could, um, you know, scan some of the things that they have in paper or some of the things that they have on microfiche. Um, they do have a fiche scanner as well. And as of like last week, the Historical Society is um, opening up some limited research appointments. I think they only allow four people in per day. Um, we actually were trying to get in to do some research for the court and um, we couldn't get an appointment. So this is, just be aware, this is something that maybe is gonna take a little bit of time. Um, it's not something you're gonna get instantaneously. So um, this is, for, for anything that you're looking for that is located in the Historical Society, they have this finding tool to locate the minutes. And so it's online, I have the link here. Um, but what you're doing is you're looking for these location numbers. And so you're starting with the year of your legislation, um, the dates, and then the committee. And so this is why we had to write those dates down. Um, it turns out that the information that we are looking for potentially is in two different boxes, um, just because of the date cutoff. We had that cutoff of March 20th. So we're going to take these location numbers and we're going to go to the Historical Society. Um, Historical Society, just a few things to note about them. Um, there, you need to bring your ID. Um, if you have an appointment, um, you can't bring in pens um, or markers. You can't bring in coats. You can't bring in bags. You have to leave that out in a locker. Um, and you can't make copies yourself. And so typically when I go, I, I just take pictures of my phone of things that I need. Um, and it, it also, it's going to take some time. Um, and I'll show you why that is. So if you, in case you don't know, the Judicial Center is the, is the big, um, is the red box in the upper right to the right of the Capitol. Um, the Historical Society is down in the bottom left. So it's on the Capitol complex. This is what their reading room looks like. Um, this is from another direction. Um, most of their materials are in closed stacks, which is why we got those location numbers. So when you get there, you're going to fill out a slip like this with your location number, your name, um, your table number. I'll just go back a screen here. Um, all of these tables have numbers. And so you're gonna pick a table, you're gonna note it. Um, write it on your slip and um, you walk it up to the live to the person who's at the desk and they take your slip and this is what they do with it. They um, fax it to the basement where there is a guy who has a forklift and he gets it off of the fax machine and he drives his forklift to find your box. Um, and this goes on and on and on, but this is what it looks like down there. Um, so you get your, they, um, the, the guy goes with the forklift, he gets your box, he um, takes it over to the dumbwaiter, puts it on the dumbwaiter, and then it comes up to the main level and somebody then wheels it over to your table on a card. So this is what can take some time. Um, you know, this, depending on, I mean, obviously they're not super busy right now because they're mostly closed, but um, you know, this can take some time. It's, it involves people retrieving materials for you. Um, so this is what it looks like inside the file. You have each of these tabs marked with a date. And so what you're doing is you're taking your dates that we had found earlier, and you're looking at the materials for each of the dates that your bill was in committee. And you're just paging through looking for your bill number because other things happen um, on those days other than just what was happening to your bill. Um, so there'll be a lot of things in here that don't relate to your research. Um, but this is what the um, this is what the minutes look like in you know paper version. This is 
this was some different research I was doing, but um, you know, similar to what we saw before online, basically just talking about um, who testified and giving us a date. <laughs> Um, and then here were, here were some examples that I found in the files. This was unrelated to the research I was doing, but it was kind of interesting. There was some legislation that was being talked about in committee about changing the county recorder, um, how county recorders were selected. And so there was um, there were many letters in the file about um, people in for, you know, in favor of it and um, people who are opposed to it. So lots of letters um, from other county recorders about the legislation that were in there. So this is when we early on when we talked about attachments to the minutes, this was an example of what you'd find if you were looking in paper, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, the again, the the purpose of the um, minutes is to get us connected to recordings um, so that we know on what days the um, on what days we're looking for the testimony um, so that we can then go back and and um, listen to the audio or watch the video. So if you need to go to the legislative reference library to get materials, um, it's a little bit of a different situation. Um, it's not closed like the, it's not closed stacks like the History Center. Um, and again, here's the legislative reference library in the upper left. It's in the state office building. So it's kind of on the other side of the Capitol from the Judicial Center where we're located. Um, and this is what their back room looks like if you're looking, if you're going there to get minutes and uh, when they open up. Um, but they've got just all of these binders on the shelves with um, the minutes located um, by date and by committee. And again, you know, you'll tell them what you need, they'll pull it off the shelf and you, you kind of page through like you did through the um, folders that we had at, at the Historical Society. And so in case this is overly confusing, and I apologize, I know I'm giving you a ton of information, but you would be at the History Center or the Legislative Reference Library looking for minutes depending on the time frame. So some of the the um, some of them are online, some of them are at this at the legislative reference library, and then the older things are at the history center. Um, so you probably in for one piece of legislation wouldn't be going to both locations, you'd be going to one or the other, um, if it's too old to be online. So let's talk a little bit about what to do if the law is too old, because we get these questions fairly often where we have somebody who's looking for legislation that is pre-1991. Um, we know there are no recordings, but there is still some hope that you'll be able to find some indication of what the legislature was thinking when they created um, laws. And a lot of it is around contemporaneous coverage of the the legislation. So either in the newspaper at the time, maybe it was covering the legislative session, hopefully it was something that was newsworthy and maybe there would have been coverage of it. Um, and also we often find that old CLEs can be useful. Um, you know, if there's a major change in the law, there's gonna be a CLE that's done, you know, after the legislation is over to, you know, teach the lawyers all about the new law. Um, we keep all old Minnesota CLEs. Um, we have them back, you know, to the 60s. And so if we're lucky, sometimes we can find a, a CLE book about the change in the law. And often there'll be some information about why the law was changed. Um, so old CLEs, newspaper coverage, and then um, also law reviews and um, bar journal articles. Often, again, if it's something um, kind of a major change in the law, um, somebody wrote about it. Um, and we have, um, some of you may have access to Westlaw. Um, Westlaw is often not going to get us everything we need because um, 
it doesn't have all of the kind of small little Minnesota publications. Um, I'm going to show you an example on the next screen. Um, and it also tends to not go back far enough for some of these older things that we're looking for. Um, but the the state law library has uh, a research tool called the Minnesota Legal Periodical Index, and it goes back to 1984. And so it's not a full text database, so it's not like searching Westlaw, but it allows you to search, you know, the title of the document, um, the subject headings, the author, um, date, and then publication. And so even though it doesn't have full text, we have the all of the articles in paper. And so if you find something on the on the periodical index that you're interested in seeing, you know, we can scan it from the paper and email it to you. But this is an example of an article that I found um, not too long ago when I was helping um, somebody on the court with doing some research. And um, this this article provided a really, really good um, description of the problems that the new legislation were trying to fix. It was a really good article. Um, I mean, it was exactly what we needed um, because we didn't, it was 1988 and, um, you know, there there was no audio video to be had, um, but this was a really good article that um, provided a lot of that um, contemporaneous explanation of why the, the law was changed. Okay, so there are a few other options, um, and these are things that are uh, created either by the House or Senate or by the Legislative Reference Library that I want to make sure that you know about. Um, there are various publications, um, Senate Daily, the, Se the Session Weekly, the Senate Briefly, um, that cover the goings on of the House and the Senate um, during the legislative session. And, and I'll show you a, a couple of examples, but they give you some useful information. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll find your bill um, listed with a little summary of, of it. Um, I think I might have also mentioned that the Legislative Reference Library puts together a session notebook for the legislative sessions, um, which can be helpful sometimes, um, particularly if it was a something that was more noteworthy. Um, and then they also have a legislative time capsule page for all of the legislatures going back to the territorial days. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, this is from 1987. I'm just going to scroll down here. Um, and sometimes you'll get some interesting information like we can see that looks like takeover laws. There was a big there was a big change in the, that legislative session about about takeover laws at the request of Dayton Hudson, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I wanted to show you here, these are some of those documents, the legislation, other information that they provide helpful links to. And so you don't have to try to like figure out where on the website they're located. Um, the time capsule will often give you the links to the years that you need to look in. And then, you know, they're PDFs, you go in and you just do a control F and type in your, your um, bill number to get to that page um, where your bill shows up. Sometimes you get lucky and find something helpful. So I wanted to give you an example of how these can be used. Um, one is, this is from, um, and I apologize, can't remember if this is the session weekly or the Senate briefly, but they both include schedules. So sometimes um, I've used this when I couldn't get to the minutes to find out when testimony happened on a bill is I use the schedules in these documents to find out when my bill was when there was testimony on my bill. Um, so then I didn't have to worry about the minutes. I kind of could skip the minutes and go right to the audio um, or video. And then sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll get a bill summary. Um, and this is a great one. This was the, this was the legislation dealing with the change, um, people getting a ticket for passing the bus when the lights were flashing. Um, 
it used to be that you had to, a police officer had to witness this. And so there were some changes made um, to the legislation. And they talked all about, this article talked all about the person who kind of came to the legislator to talk about why this bill was needed and why it was changed. Um, and this is interesting when I was reading this because it had to do with um, Hampton, Minnesota, that the she watched people, you know, flying by, uh, stopped school bus with the lights flashing um, and almost hit a child. I drive through Hampton um, every day on my way to work and um, I often see the school bus stopped on the main on the main road. So this was a really nice little summary of why this legislation was put forward. So this is what the session notebooks look like. Um, you can see here we have the first binder. This is from 1971, um, some summaries. Also in, 70, in the second binder. And then we've got clippings. Um, so sometimes there'll be clippings that the legislative reference librarians have cut out about legislation or about the session that are in these binders. So these are not online. Um, they involve um, going there and looking through the books when the legislative reference library is open, but um, they can be very useful. Um, now I want to end with talking about effective dates because this is often something that's really important to know when you're doing legislative history research is, okay, so the law changed, but when did it take effect? Um, and the general rule is that it takes effect August 1st following the final enactment, unless there's a different date. So that's kind of the general rule is the legislative session typically ends in May and most laws then take effect that, um, that a few months later in August, on August 1st um, at 12.01 a.m. And this is a statute. This isn't, this isn't anything hidden. This is 645.02. So the next question is, um, well, here's an example actually of, um, how it might show up in a session law when the um, effective date is not August 1st. Um, and I think this might have been the criminal expungement statute or the session law that made all the changes to the, uh, maybe not. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, so we can see here that they're telling us that certain sections will go into effect on August 1st. Some of them will go into effect on July 1st. And then um, Section 10 is affected the day after final enactment. So then the next question that we often get from law clerks is what what does final enactment mean? And that, again, is defined in the statute. Um, usually it means that it's signed by the governor. That final enactment is um, the day, the date and time that the governor signed the bill. So that doesn't always fit because sometimes um, the governor lets the um, law become, lets the bill become law without his, his signature. Um, so then the statute addresses that situation where we're talking about a, a pocket veto. Um, or if we have a situation where the governor vetoed it, but then the legislature overrode the veto, um, then we have a different rule about that. But it's all covered in the statutes. Um, so you can figure it out um, based on, on what the session law says. And so I'm gonna just end with this slide telling you that um, I recognize that I gave you a ton of information in this hour. Um, a lot of it, like I said at the beginning, probably is not gonna make sense until you actually have to do it yourself. Um, but there are a few of us that do legislative history research fairly frequently. Um, if you have questions about the presentation, um, again, the slides are gonna be posted along with the recording and a handout with all the resources on our website in the CLE section. Um, so if you have questions about the presentation, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you just have questions about legislative history in the, free, in the future, um, there's our reference email address. It's always better to contact the reference desk in case I'm not available, you'll get a quicker response. Um, the Ask a Librarian and then also our phone number for the reference desk. So um, I hope this was useful. Um, I encourage you to ask for help if you need it because 
it's not the kind of thing that you're going to be an expert after watching this for an hour. Um, you know, you have an idea of what's out there and how difficult it might be and kind of where old stuff is and where new stuff is. Um, but when you actually have to sit down and do it, sometimes it's, it can be pretty daunting. So um, please feel free to ask for help about legislative history research or other questions that you have about research. Um, that's what we do every day. And we're happy to assist lawyers and law clerks and judges and um, all kinds of folks in their research that they're doing. So that's all I have. Um, I think um, I probably am not going to stop for questions. I mean, it's one o'clock, but shoot me questions individually if you um, have them. And we'll um, go ahead and end it there. Thank you.